The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the second chapter. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence which is not lawful for any, for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around with them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The Gospel of the Lord. Maybe you know this about me, but I like to cook now and then. Right? My favorite thing to cook is a nice big ham roast. And the reason I like to cook it so much is because I learned how to cook it from my grandmother. There are all kinds of steps that go into getting the juiciest, most perfectest ham to serve for dinner. Now, I'm not going to give away all the secrets, but there's steps that involve brining and glazing. And then most importantly, you have to cut the ends off of the ham before it goes into the oven. So as I was teaching Kim this top secret recipe, she was allowed, as we were cooking one day, we got to talking about each step and why we do it. And and all of it made sense, except for cutting off the ends. Why was that important? Why does this have to do with cooking this? So so the next day, I, I got to talking to my mom about the recipe, and I asked her about cutting off the ends, and she had no idea. So finally I went to the source and I asked my grandmother, why do we have to cut the ends off of the ham, I asked her. Well, you don't have to, she said. I did it because I didn't have a dish large enough to fit the whole ham. (laughs) Okay, I, I can see some of you. You know this is not my story. It's an old wives' tale that's been told by many, many, many people, but it seems, I think, to succinctly answer the question of why we do so many of the things we do, which is because we've always done it that way. Right? Now, I know this could be hard to believe, but from time to time, in the profession that I'm in, I hear that response when I ask questions. Why do we do this certain thing in worship? Pastor, we've always done it that way. Why do we not do this when it could really make things easier? Oh, we've always done it that way. Why do two churches sell the exact same thing at the exact same prices right across the street from each other at the Cole Camp Fair? Because we've always done it that way. Well, let's talk about that. Because sometimes that's okay, right? Experience tells us what works and what doesn't. And maybe it's been a long time in the making to make something work properly. These rituals and practices that we do in worship are meant to bring familiarity and meaning. What we, what we do, you know, we do it because it might have generations, if not centuries, of experience behind it. Because this stuff means something. 
If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But you knew there was going to be a but, right? But we all know that this refrain of, of just doing things because that's just what we do or we've always done it that way can quickly turn on itself and take away the, the real meaning and the real purpose of what you're trying to do. I mean, think about grandma's ham. If you have a big enough pan and you're still cutting off the ends of that thing, well, you're losing part of the meat of your dinner and potentially letting all those juices run out the ends, I guess. I don't, I've never cooked a ham, actually. <laughs> you, know? It, you know? If we're doing these things in worship, just because that's what we've always done, and we have no idea why we're doing these things, then we completely miss the point of doing them in the first place. Think about what happened with Jesus in this story of, of him on the Sabbath. Why were those Pharisees so upset about these disciples plucking heads of grain to eat on the Sabbath? Well, yeah, in the Jewish tradition, you were supposed to do no work on the Sabbath. None. Anything that exerted effort was to be avoided. You know, today in the devout Jewish tradition, that means any preparation for meals had to be done uh, before the Sabbath began. There's no driving, no electricity is to be used. I don't know, I've just seen this recently that, that some of the newer appliances actually have a Sabbath mode where at a certain time in the week, the clocks shut off of the, of the ovens and when you open the door to the refrigerator, the light won't come on. That day was meant for rest and for worship and for reading and personal devotion and for family. Doing anything other than that or not being prepared for a Sabbath took away from the Sabbath's intended purpose. Now, Sabbath was a gift from God, time set apart from the rest of the week. So they all knew, the Pharisees and Jesus and the disciples, the Sabbath was important. And what Jesus', was, Jesus disciples were doing was, yes, breaking Sabbath law. And when they did, the Pharisees confronted Jesus about it. And at that point, Jesus didn't deny that they did what they were not supposed to do. He knew the law as well. He didn't downplay the importance of the law at all. What he did was confront the anger and the stubbornness of those Pharisees. What he did was confront the purpose of the law, the purpose of why they're doing what they're doing. So when we hear this exchange, it, it kind of feels like a toss-up as to what the Pharisees are complaining about. Are they truly concerned that people are breaking Sabbath law? They could be. Or do they have their undies in a bind because, but we've always done it that way. It almost sounds like Jesus believes it's the latter. Yes, they're breaking the law, but would, what, do you want them to starve? Those Pharisees were more concerned about keeping the laws than they were about the welfare of these people. Like Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. The purpose of the Sabbath was to bring life and enhance life for the people and bring about the freedom that they, knew, that they were experiencing. It was not a law that was meant to be over the people, to burden them, to, and to see who was the better law keeper. We see this even more poignantly when Jesus tests those Pharisees, when he goes to that synagogue and, and seeing if they would allow something that is healing or life-giving to happen on that Sabbath. And so he did. He healed that man with the withered hand, and the Pharisees got mad. Again, apparently it was more important to follow the letter of the law than it was to care for others. I'm glad Jesus fixed that for us. No, we still face all of that today, don't we? Propping up things and ideals to be more important than caring for one another or finding ways that will bring about life or abundance in this world. Why? Why do we do that? 
Because we've always done it that way. Because no matter how many times we hear the call from Jesus to care for our neighbor or for the least of these, we still get distracted by looking out for my, me, myself, and I first and foremost. Because we are right and they're wrong. Or because we too are more concerned with the letter of the law and, and keeping up with worldly things than we are, look, than look for, than we are than for looking out for heavenly things. I keep being drawn back to that line from Jesus. The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for, for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, he said. Why do we keep being drawn back into the ways of this world when we hear over and over and over again that Jesus has a different way, that Jesus is Lord over all of those different ways? Without Jesus having come into this world, all that we would be left with in the end is death. But we know that because of the Easter story and because of what God did in the face of death, the end of our story now brings life. So why can't the things that we do in this world, because of that story, also bring life? And not just life for us, but life for the whole world and everyone and everything in it. Whatever we do, you know, whatever decisions we make, whenever we interact with another person, whenever we do something that seems so routine, do we ask ourselves, are we doing this because this is the way we've always done it? Or are we doing this because this is something that will bring about life? You know, despite what our worldly laws say, what are we doing to care for the outcast or the immigrant, the broken, the despised, the hurting, or the one who is just plain different than us? The Son of Man is Lord, first and foremost, over all that we do in the face of the other. And that's what made him so hated by those authorities. He did those things that brought about life. He did those things that brought about healing and wholeness. He did those things despite what the law said and despite what was the usual thing to do. Have we forgotten why we do such things? Jesus came so that we could have life. And Jesus came so that the world could have life. And for all of that, I say, thanks be to God. Amen.